Amazon, which is a company that has 30% of your portfolio, uh, relatively, I would say within the last four or five years, released a product called Prime Video, in which they are like, all right, we have 200 million people. Let's just throw a bunch of content at them and uh, let's yeah. they, they watch some of this stuff. And this, con- uh, this competes directly with something that you are very bullish on, something that you were buying at $600. You were like, I'm, I'm, I'm with this company, which is yeah, Netflix. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you know this about me, but I wouldn't say I'm a big bear on Netflix. I just fundamentally disagree with the thesis that Netflix has the ability. Sure. I don't think it should be a thing. I, I really, so I want to lay out my thesis and then I want to ask you a little bit of questions. And it's just like a one minute thesis on how I think about Netflix. Sure. I think about Netflix as a media company at the end of the day. I don't see them as a technology company. Now, if they do this video game platform developer stuff, maybe it becomes more tech, but I see it, I see it as a movie theater inside your house. They have a recommendation algorithm which I guess you could say makes it technology, but even that recommendation algorithm in comparison to something like YouTube, I think is like, it, it's, it's apples to, to, to pairs. I mean, like, like YouTube yeah. has your search results, your click history, it, it no, the AI actually knows what you, ha- what you care about um, just through, 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 predi- through predictive uh, simulations. Netflix has content inside of Netflix and it has to dig through that content that hopefully it will, it will give to you. And until they have a new release, there's nothing really new to recommend to you. So I'm not bullish on Netflix's uh, uh, recommendation algorithm. I'm not bullish on the fact that they spend $20 billion a year just to get content. And that content dies out very quickly. I mean, they spend all this money on Don't Look Up, a great movie. Awesome movie, but now no one really cares. They get a new show. All right, you put that new show. It's binged in like three hours or like 10 hours. Now that's gone, right? So now what do I watch? Whereas YouTube, you have constant videos coming per minute. YouTube has a harder time finding good content because you have the world uploading a lot of shitty videos. Uh, But Netflix, I think, has a problem with getting a lot of content because they have to constantly make the content or license the content to ultimately get it onto the platform. So when it was at $700, um, you know, I, I just felt obviously everything was overvalued, but when it got down to 300 and 350, I was like, okay, it, it's, it's a little bit back to normal, but now that they have a, a, something like 80% of U S households or something, and now they're looking international to expand. It, it seems very weird to me that Netflix would be growing at 20, 30% year over year in terms of households. When you factor in all the competition with HBO max and everything else that exists with Netflix. And, and then my final bear thesis is, I just don't think the content is that good. Personally, like I just, and maybe that's a personal, right. I don't, Bridgerton does not turn me on. Um, yeah. So, so I guess my question to you is like, you're a very sound, <laughs> logical person. What really is the bull case for you for why you think Netflix can become this behemoth company? I know Bill Ackman got it. I don't understand that. I can't really comprehend why he did that. But what, why do you think he bought it? And why are you continuing to buy the stock? Sure. Sure. Well, just to clear one thing up. Bill Ackman did buy the stock after I was already in it. So this yeah. wasn't a follow Bill Ackman into it. Yes. I kind of followed Domino. I, I kind of followed Bill Ackman into Domino's. I did not follow him into Netflix. Um, but to back up a bit, yeah, some of the things that you mentioned, um, the first thing is, is companies that I think provide a lot of value and they somehow have a way of, of getting customers to stick with them for like over a decade, uh, and they continue to have that type of, uh, you know, loyalty of customer, I think is, is a good indicator to begin with. Like I look at Netflix and I first signed up for it, I think I was in college like 10 years ago yeah. and I've been a subscriber to it for that entire time. So the lifetime value of a customer, I consider to be very significant. If you get someone that gets into something like that, and then they can just keep you month after month for 10 plus years. And I think there's only a handful of companies that are doing that. There's Costco, there's maybe Spotify, there's Netflix, uh, there's Amazon with Amazon Prime, but that lifetime value of a customer, I think is significant. Now you look at what Netflix has done over the past 10 years, right? Since 2017, they launched their streaming service and they were going against every big media company that were infinitively bigger than them. They licensed their own content and they weaponized it against all these big tech companies, right? And Disney and Comcast. And with about $17 billion of capital. That's how much debt they had. They literally surpassed all those companies at their own game, right. creating a, a global subscriber base of over 200 million subscribers at a very high revenue per user. And right. they did that with $17 billion, which is minimal. I mean, these big, these big companies are competing with are huge. Um, the leadership of Netflix is has so much foresight and so much long-term thought in what they're doing that early on they realize that soon enough these companies like Disney will catch up. 
and they'll take off all their content off of Netflix because they know that we're going to become bigger than them if they continue to do this. And sure, uh, what they did was uh, Ted Serranos, he's the like co-CEO now, but he's actually, he's been a significant part of Netflix since the beginning. Um, he realized that this was happening and he went to read Hastings and he's basically like, hey, we got to start creating our own original content because we can't be reliant on theirs. They're going to pull it after a certain amount of time. That's when he, he green-lighted House of Cards was like their mm -hmm. big first hit. Right. So they start building up their original content library and it makes up a bigger and bigger percentage of their spend over time in anticipation of competitive threat of these like, you know, Comcast and NBC and all them turning, uh, making their own streaming services. Now, the situation they're in now is uh, I think one thing that actually worked against them, it was more detrimental than helpful. At first, it looked helpful, which was COVID. Because, oh, we're stuck at home. Netflix is going to crush it, right? That's so good for Netflix. They gained 20 million subscribers in one quarter, right? How great for them. Not great. Because what they were doing was sneaky beforehand. They were doing it on pace, building out their own business. And COVID basically told every other company, hey, you have to become Netflix right away, right? So it actually sped up and attracted more competition from the, the other companies. So Disney's like, all right, we got to put all of our content on Disney+. Plus. Um, NBC's like, we got to create Peacock and so forth. Uh, but anyways, I actually think that was a detriment to Netflix just because of the competition it attracted. But I look at the, the situation Netflix is in now. Um, in my opinion, they've always faced a lot of competition. The, the way that you can tell if competition is really affecting them is by their churn rate, meaning right. are people canceling Netflix to go to other options? And what we've seen so far is that their churn rate remains the exact same. It hasn't gone up at all because people are leaving cable TV, they're freeing up 80 to hundred dollars a month. And they're going, you know, I'll keep Netflix and I'll add on HBO for three months and watch their series. And I might watch Disney, you know, I'll sign up when the new, uh, whatever the new show comes out on Disney. I want to watch. I'll sign up for a couple months and watch that. Uh, but Netflix seems to have this position as being kind of the centerpiece of it. And it's not the one that people go to, to cancel, which makes sense because the, you say that their content expires quickly, which is true, but they have more content being recycled through their service than any other. Right. So they, they recycle content or they, they rather iterate their content and come out with new content at a much faster clip than Peacock. Yes. Like Peacock's going to continue showing you part. Every time you log in, they'll show you parks and rec and they'll show you the office, the office. Cause it's like, that's what we got. We don't have anything new we gotta show you the same stuff. Right. And that's going to be it. Right. They, and then they'll try to have their like news shows because that's actually new content, but Netflix, every time you log in almost every day, it's going to feature like a brand new series. Right. That's because they come out with 150 to 200 individual episodes per month, which is on pace of about the rest of them combined. Right. So the value proposition is still pretty good. I realize that in my opinion, Netflix is the big, and, and the criticism you have is shared by me. The big problem they have is they're not good at making movies like Warner Media. They mm -hmm. I like, uh, you know, I was watching just, uh, in fact, last night I was watching a Netflix movie called like bubble or something like that. Okay. And it was some about actors, like, I don't know. It, we stopped watching it after like 10 minutes. And then I went on to another Netflix show, which was, uh, um, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, Blade Runner, but it wasn't a Netflix movie. It was a Warner media movie that Netflix is licensed. And I'm like, right. this feels like a movie. This is fantastic. Right. And so their movies just aren't great. They, they need to get better at that. I just think it's something they need to improve, but they're coming out with like a movie a week. I think they will get better. In fact, I, I really think objectively they are getting better at movies. Right. Like Don't Look Up was a better movie than, you know, ones they were coming out with two years ago. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the big thing is if churn rate started to go up and people were leaving to other platforms, then I'd be more concerned. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that their margins have gone from roughly six 6% in 2017 to about 26%. Mm, I don't know they that. Were, yeah, they were, their debt, if you look at their debt levels, quarter by quarter, it was climbing up as they're using debt to fund more content aggressively to get ahead of this big shift in, in, you know, with other companies competing with them. Now their debt's completely flat because their free cash flow profile has improved. Uh, they actually did share buybacks. They're going to be continuing to do share buybacks in the future. So they're not, they have enough subscribers now and enough revenue that they're actually funding the growth in their content completely through their revenue, not through any debt, not through issuing shares. So they're no longer diluting shareholders. They're no longer issuing debt. 
and they're actually going to generate positive free cash flow and, and be doing share buybacks. So there's a lot of fundamental improvements. Um, and you know, I, I look at it and I I did some like this, you know, discounted cash flow analysis on it. My estimation is that they'll make around low end of $30 of earnings per share in 2025. That was, or that was my estimation on it. So I think they'll put it at like 950, around $900 a share. Mm. Um, but that's my I estimate. I mean, it's massively I, undervalued. That's what you're saying. Yeah, you I think it, I think so. Now, there, you know, because something's undervalued right now, doesn't mean that events will unfold in the future that won't change it, right? Uh, the big thing that investors are concerned about, like if you looked at the reason they sold was they were... Their first quarter, um, they were expected by the street to give, to give guidance of like 5 million subscriber gains globally. Right. right. And they came out and said, we're going to gain two, two right. million. Right. And when you go from five to two, when your growth rate goes down more than 50%, 20% drop in the stock. But I guess um, that's my question. If, they, if, if that's their guidance, do you think that's going to get bigger? Like, like, or do you think they're going to stay flat at two, three million a quarter just because of how big they already are? If they stay flat at two to three million a quarter, the company is, is probably overvalued right now. Um, it, that can't be the story, right? Because the idea behind Netflix is that if you take out China and Russia, there's like roughly 800 plus million households, 800 to 900 million that don't have Netflix. And that's like across all their, the countries that they can do business in. And they're currently at 222. So they have a huge total addressable market to naturally grow in. And the nice thing about Netflix is unlike Disney, where they make content in the US and try to market to everyone, right? Not every culture loves the exact same content. Like Netflix is making these South Korean shows, yep. um, you know, like Squid Game that become international hits. Right. So they already have studios and relationships all across the world. And they're trying to, to figure it out, but they're having trouble. In Latin America, they had, uh, they had trouble last quarter. They were expecting higher growth and they're just saying the growth has slowed down. They think it's because... Like in the US, we're kind of over COVID. Most of us have money. We can afford Netflix if we really want it. You know, you go into poor countries and like they're still being, their economy is still kind of crushed by it. A lot of them don't have a ton of discretionary money. So they have to have jobs and be working to be able to afford something like Netflix. So uh, I think some of the struggles are temporary with Netflix. A lot of them with international growth. Um, in India, their content strategy is also like they, they're just trying to, you know, like a tech company, they're iterating, trying to figure out the content strategy in India because they're not getting the signups that they wanted. They're hoping to have about 50 million in India by now, and they don't. They have like a few million. So they're, they lowered the prices to be more competitive. They're just trying to scale. And um, I, I think they'll figure it out. So I look at it too as like long-term, every single year without fail, a, a, a th thousands of more people, millions of more people cancel cable TV. Right. So it's just like a slow churn of cable television. And there's streaming companies that are going to take advantage of that within the streaming companies. I think Netflix will be one. And then the companies that you bring up that are big competitors, Amazon and, you know, Apple, these companies, I think will be, be ones as well. So, 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 what I'm so what I'm hearing is the bull case is like Netflix has such a first mover advantage in the streaming place and such yep. a competitive foothold, at just, just from a brand recognition perspective, that even the companies I mentioned, which, yeah, HBO Max and Amazon are there. I don't think they have anything on Netflix, is quite frankly speaking. They're threats, but it's Netflix. Yeah. It's Netflix. Like your argument is, and I love the point you said about canceling. It's like when you think about canceling, I would cancel HBO Max tomorrow. Like, I don't care. But I know like my parents yeah. they wouldn't let me cancel Netflix, right? So like, you're not going to cancel Netflix. So if you're not going to cancel Netflix, that's there. And then number two, if they're getting better at making these don't look up type of movies weekly now or even monthly, then they're going to have really, really strong, just like top of the funnel brand awareness to get people into the door and sell them this yep. subscription. The last thing I want to ask you about is, is a premium content versus user-generated content. Like, do you think YouTube and TikTok and user-generated content ever is going to be able to outpace this type of premium quality stuff people want to watch when they, when they get on their couch? Yeah. So when you, when you compare Netflix, first of all, to Google or to Amazon, um, I think Amazon and Google and Apple are better investments. That's why I, I am so overexposed to those companies. So I, they're weighted huge in my portfolios. I have a ton of Apple. I have a ton of Amazon. It's my biggest holding. And then I have more Google than I have Netflix. Mm. So when you're comparing, like if the argument is, well, Netflix is good, but it's not as good as big tech. 
That argument is shared by me. I don't think anything is. That's why I have a huge portion of my portfolio in it. I could go all big tech, but I just feel like that's, you know, I want to diversify a little bit into right. second and third best bets, right? Um, but I look at Netflix and compare it to user-generated co content. I think it will always be different. So I think people want both. There's obviously, like YouTube, the amazing thing is, is they just have the platform. The users generate all the content and then they, you know, you barter for ad space on it and then Google makes all the money while just running a platform. So they obviously have an incredibly good business model. But I also look at YouTube as um, YouTube creators will continually, as the economics improve of YouTube, like think about how much money creators are, are making on YouTube, right? It's this huge opportunity to build a business and you can do it with almost no startup costs. Like you can just start uploading videos. Um, with that type of opportunity and the real economics working to support, support full-time work and hire employees and editors and, you know, lighting people and stuff like to do it professionally, I see YouTubers continually reinvesting more and more into production and it becoming more and more upscaled. Like, mm. you know, I've even done it myself. Like I got nicer camera on and spending stuff like that. Like, you know, I see you, you two years from now, you're going to have your own huge studio and write a production team. Like it's just going to happen as channels grow and they gain more, more followers and you get more money. You're going to see this, the production increase. Um, so I'm very bullish on, on Google and YouTube. Uh, but I, I still think. You think there's a different, a different offering that people do when they sit on their couch, they're not pulling up YouTube. Like they want a nice premium offering like Netflix. Right. So I think that people, they want it all. Content is huge. They want, they want the very short-term mindless content that they can flip through their phone when they're eat in a, you know, breakfast or whatever, right? That's like TikTok. Like I want to watch something. Then you got YouTube and YouTube shorts. Uh, that's like, I want my kind of new stuff, updated stuff, but YouTube, you're not going to go to, to watch like squid game. Like right. who's going to create that on YouTube, right? That's kind right. of a different sphere. And I think that stuff's going to remain on Netflix, on HBO. I think Apple TV and Amazon prime. Um, I think it will have a role to play because the amount of entertainment people want is immense. Uh, and these platforms are the ones providing it the best. Like Netflix is, you know, the, the leading direct, no, no advertisement, direct to consumer, ubiquitous streaming service. YouTube is all user generated content, extremely high quality. It can support people financially to be able to do it full time. Yeah. Um, and then I think, I think other companies, I think big tech is being very much, I, I think they're like sleepers right now in content. I think Apple will blow away people with the content they'll come out with. Knowing the company, they start off small. They'll come out with, with stuff that will lower their churn rate and be real competitive threat. And I think Amazon's already kind of doing that. So yeah, I, I, uh, I'm bullish on all of them, I guess is what I'm saying, but for different reasons.